Hi there, I'm John O. Freeman. This presentation is called Pick Tidbits. Pick Tidbits, Pick Tidbits, Pick Tidbits, yeah! Taking a peek at some pickies for the stories they tell. Drawn from a magical book called Francis Bacon's Personal Life Story by Alfred Dodd. Examining key portraits will probe the mystery of Shakespeare's bust in Stratford's Trinity Church, the absurdity of the Dreschaut engraving from the first folio, alongside of the humble honesty and majesty of some Bacon treatments. Let's talk about portraits, Bates. Let's talk about shacks and Bates. Let's talk about all the good things and the wrong things and the fakes. And the fakes! Quickly, an appendage. Though Duncan may have said, There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. We'd like to consider the messages found in Elizabethan portraiture using physiognomy to assess portrayals of character and personality. Part one, portraits of the man from Stratford, AKA Shakespeare, 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 Shakespeare. As with the name, we'll see just how ambiguous the likenesses are of our shacks from Strats. Honestly, he's on shaky ground to begin with, as shacks was a nobody, not to be painted. There's no concrete evidence he ever commissioned a portrait and there's no written description of his physical appearance. Plus, he was a straw man for a circle of writers engaged in a dangerous literary enterprise. According to the Wick, there are only two portraits that definitively portray William Shakespeare, both of which are posthumous, an important point. One is the Dreschaut engraving from 1623, and the other is the sculpture that adorns his memorial in Stratford from around the same time. Experts and critics have argued that several other paintings of the period may represent him, but in none of them. Not the Chandos, not the Cobb, which is actually Sir Thomas Overbury anyway, guys. <laughs> Has Shakespeare's identity been proved? This is Wenceslas Holler's engraving, published in the Antiquities of Warwickshire, 1656, of the bust and likeness of Shakespeare, the actor, by Gerald Jansen, as it then appeared in the Trinity Church. Its correctness is independently confirmed by an engraving of the same monument in Rowe's Life of Shakespeare, 1709. Together, these portraits afford complete evidence that the present monument, erected in 1749, is a highly embellished counterfeit. The first bust was erected sometime before 1623, and it must have been accepted as a good likeness by the illiterate villagers who knew him, though they didn't know the meaning of the Latin inscription framing the bust. Its erection is a mystery. Who commissioned and paid for it? Who wrote this Latin inscription? There are traces of Ben Jonson. Hollar's engraving was actually based on a sketch from a private 1634 manuscript by Sir William Dugdale. This is the only verifiable portrait of the man from Stratford, who many regard as Shakespeare. Dugdale was a Warwickshire man, well acquainted with Stratford and a great admirer of the works. He was a practised draftsman writing this great book on antiquities, which naturally he wished to be as perfect as possible. But curiously, the man he has drawn is rather out of proportion, with a tiny head and a long body and the arms of a gibbon. Fella's hands are as large as his head. Was he deliberately depicting Shakespeare as some kind of ape? <laughs> Johnson wrote a poem called Poet Ape, bitter in temper towards the actor and exposing him as a thief, a fleecer. But Johnson had nothing but love and respect for the author, Shakespeare. Fact is, there is nothing in the 1623 bus to connect Shakespeare with literature. 
The bust and the signatures we possess harmonise in their coarseness. They typify a hard businessman, totally devoid of intellectuality. The original bust was removed from the wall in 1746 for repairs, but it was decided to scrap it entirely and erect a brand new monument in its place. J. Dover Wilson describes the demeanour of this new effigy as being like a self-satisfied pork butcher. This smirking doll face, now dressed in an academic gown, is very different from the shrewd, hard-faced man who knew exactly how to drive a bargain. Let's look at some of the chief differences between the two. In the original Jansen bust, the face is that of a rustic and the expression discontented. Beard is untrimmed, moustache long and drooping. The hands are symbolic of a grasping and covetous nature. The hands are also holding back a bag of wool or grain tied with cord at four corners. In the present reproduction, the expression on the face is bland and an attempt has been made to substitute a gentleman for a plebeian. Beard is elegantly trimmed, moustache short and upturned a style not worn until the days of Charles II. The hands are holding a pen and resting on a blank piece of paper. The bag has been replaced by a cushion with tassels at the corners. Shakespeare was not known in Stratford as a writer of plays, but as an important landowner and tradesman. His fellow townsfolk would have been quite satisfied with the original monument. And if he had been depicted with a pen, they would have wanted to know why. It's a fact that Shakespeare made no claim during his lifetime or in his will to have written anything in any shape or form. So the attributes listed in the inscription of a great philosopher, judge and poet are incompatible with the recorded facts of the actor's mercenary life. The monument then acknowledges two, the writer and the actor in representing Shakespeare. The same can be said of the poem opening the first folio, note the acrostic too, with the Dreschard engraving beside it. Too often has the informing spirit been confused with its mask. It turns out that our most iconic image of Shakespeare is a bit of a giggle, a wink. There is nothing else on record across a span of 200 years that is comparable with this large, undecorated and unadorned title page author portrait. Portraits were usually found on the opposite or left hand page and Shakespeare scholars are well aware that this engraving is ridiculous. It's even been called a monstrosity. The excuse has always been made for Dreschout, the engraver, and his shoddy workmanship. But other engravings of his from the time don't exhibit the same defects. They adhere to the conventions of the day, using three-dimensionality and realism. Why then did the publishers of this expensive 900-page folio volume not reject this crude and bizarre portrait for their publication? Perhaps... It's a skillfully executed enigma. Monuments don't make mistakes and Elizabethan portraiture was full of symbolism. This does look like the same man depicted in the Stratford Funeral Monument, the same high overgrown forehead, the same bouffant hair under the ears, the same rather blank expression. The head seems to levitate above the body the collar serves the head like a lump of meat on a plate, which is also rather unusually in the shape of a shield with its point behind the head. Some have suggested that the shield has something to do with some kind of protective fellowship or brotherhood. A very heavy double line separates head from body in an almost cartoon-like manner, illustrating a mask. The face of the Stratford man as a mask covering the face of the real author or authors. The man's earlobe looks more like a nose sniffing along the line of the mask. The mask has two right eyes which are lopsided. The hair is uneven on each side and the decoration on the collar is also different each side. In 1911, a tailor pointed out that the right hand side of the forepart is obviously the left hand side 
of the back part. It's like he's been folded out, which gives a harlequin, patch or clown-like appearance to the figure. We can safely assume that all this was intentionally done with express object and purpose. Why would this commissioned portrait have so many bizarre and unique features? The SAC, or Shakespeare Authorship Coalition, suggests that the man depicted was being gently and surreptitiously mocked, and that by featuring a ridiculous caricature of the Stratford man, the publishers were suggesting to the observant reader that the notion that Shakespeare was the author Shakespeare was a deception. So much for definitive portrait number two. Part two, portraits of Sir Francis Bacon. Lots of beautiful material here. Let's dive in. This is a copy of a terracotta bust of Francis, preserved at Gorhambury. The Queen visited in 1572 and the bust is attributed to this date. The Queen seems to have been very interested in Gorhambury, additionally visiting in 1568, 1579 and 1573, in the April of which he was sent to Trinity College, Cambridge. Henry VIII's college, and not Nicholas Bacon's. The bust seems to show abnormal skull development. A side note on Gorhambury. By Masonic tradition, St Albans and Gorhambury are regarded as the birthplace and cradle of Freemasonry in England. Growing up, this location gave rise in Bacon to the idea that the operative craft could be remodelled on an ethical basis, where the brethren should moralise on tools and build figurative temples to the Most High in which humanity could worship. Ben Johnson, one of Bacon's closest friends, went to reside with him at Gorhambury whilst he was editing the first folio, shortly after Francis's fall. Though Bacon tellingly never mentions the dramatic plays, one can imagine the spirit of Shakespeare walking through these gardens and grounds, through the ruined banqueting hall in the soft light of the moon. It breathes of poesy. Stratford has the letter, but Gorhambury the spirit. You can see in this beautiful miniature the youth who is destined to become the prince of poets, the most illustrious of philosophers, the most wonderful ethical teacher, our greatest world genius. In Hilliard's work, we may find a young Francis as he strolled along the cam or reclined under the elms with his fat, round face, his bluish grey eyes, his fall of dark brown curls and his ripe, jesting mouth. With his hose puffed out, his rough and rapier as the scholars wore them, in his face a thought for the bird on the tree, the fragrance in the air, the insect in the stream, no less than for the Greek dialectics and the twelve books of Euclid. If a face be indicative of the soul within, Francis Bacon at 18 was a heaven-born poet. This is a face we can imagine, glowing with the lyrics of personal emotion as he wrote Shakespeare's sonnets to his birth mother, the Queen, praying for public recognition as her Tudor son. Hilliard must have been quite swept off his feet by the genius of young Francis. Around the portrait he wrote, Could I but paint his mind? This echoes Johnson's line in the first folio poem, Could he but have drawn his wit? This miniature of the Queen was painted at the same time as the previous lot, again by the court painter Hilliard. The Queen was 46. Francis was then in the train of Sir Amias Paulet at the French court. The likeness is unmistakable. They bear a striking resemblance to each other. The artist has drawn the sitters in the same style with profiles at the same angle to denote their relationship. Dudley met Elizabeth when they were both imprisoned in the tower, a violent attachment springing up between them, although he was a married man. On Elizabeth's accession, he was loaded with riches and honours and lodged in the palace with his bedroom next to hers. He was known as the Queen's lover and they were secretly married in the house of Lord Pembroke. There is evidence which shows there were at least two children by this marriage, one being brought up by the Bacons the other younger, later known as Robert, Earl of Essex, was fostered in the home of the Queen's cousin. 
Leicester appears to have fought hard to secure acknowledgement for himself as consort and for the open recognition of his sons. But the years passed and the Queen still maintained her secret, posing as the Virgin Queen. Again, note the resemblance. The artist Van Sommer portrays Bacon's real character at about 55. A literary intellectual, a man who has matured under the varying emotions of sorrow and joy, disappointment and success. This is Hilliard's portrait come to perfect growth. Brow broad and solid, eye quick yet mild, nose straight and strong of the pure old English type, beard trim and dainty, as of one to whom grace is nature. Overall, the countenance a bold kindling light, an infinite sense of power and subtlety and humour, unmixed with any trace of pride. Every student of physiognomy will agree, Van Sommer has given us the portrait of a truly noble man. Every characteristic conveys the fact that he is the king of literature. Do we really believe that Bacon died from a cold? Shoving snow up a chook for an experiment? A body was never found in the tomb at St Michael's. It's said with the danger intensifying for him under the new King Charles, Bacon fled to the continent in the Easter of 1626 and went to live with the Andrea family. In this image, furnished by the descendants of Andrea, we get Masonic and Rosicrucian emblems with the letters FB on two of the shields. The possessors of the picture were quite uncertain that this was a picture of Andrea, who was a field worker to propagate Bacon's secret order. It is thought the only man this could be in the centre is Francis Bacon, as a very old man. If you look into the eyes, you will find him. Look here. Upon this picture, see what a grace was seated on this brow. Look you now what follows. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? What judgment would step from this to this? <laughs> Ah, till the next time, keep shaking that spear. Isn't that right, Will?